What's going on, guys? Well, Rogue One, it releases next week. We're almost there. And if you didn't know, I like to read the Star Wars books, the new canon, to figure out what the hell's going on in the universe now, in the brand new canon. And Catalyst, the reason you clicked on this video, spoiler heavy, this is the one I think makes the most sense to read before you go see a movie, obviously. I'm Christian Harlow. I'm joined by Perry Nemiroff and Ken Knapsack. Guys, let's get into this book. I think we're all in agreement that this is one of the best in regards to new canon, Ken. Absolutely, it's right up there with Lost Stars for me. Lords of the Sith is another one of my favorites. I really like Aftermath Life Debt for what it started to do with that series in, in a post-Galactic Empire world, but this one, highly anticipated, and might be the first one that you say, like you said, has to be read before the movie. I don't think you can need to, right. but it would help. Harry? Yeah, no, I'm in full agreement with that. I don't know if this trumps Lost Stars for me because that was just a very special experience. It reminds me a lot of, of a lot of other young adult books that I've read where mm. you get you get uh, obsessed with that group of characters and you just want to live with them all the time. I did have that with Catalyst, but not to the same extent as that. However, this might be my number two at this point, and I 100 agree with you, you do not need to read this book, I don't think at least, in order to enjoy Rogue One. However, knowing the backstories of these characters, I mean, it, it's even making a difference for me right now just watching the trailers. Yeah, it heightens the experience for sure. Now, if we're talking about like favorite, the favorite of all time, I'm not putting it in there either, but I do think, agreeing with you, Ken, it's the most important to read. I think that it, it'll give you the most experience, the most tie-ins to film. Now, there are things about Lost Stars, even Lords of the Sith, that you can go, oh, that's cool, making me look a little bit differently. This is all the setup. I mean, so like we said, or as like you see in, in the title of this video, it is a spoiler heavy review because we want to get into the plot here. I was interested right off the bat when this thing started that we were, it's very similar to Lost Stars, doesn't just deal with one time period. It spans across a bunch of time periods and uh, things that we are very familiar with. It starts a year after Attack of the Clones to where we see where Galen Erso is working and then he gets caught prison to where it ultimately is the, it's the inciting incident that kind of gets him in bed with the Empire. Yeah, he's working for something called Zerpin Industries. It's kind of like a, I don't want to say non, non-profit, but it's, they're, they're not affiliated with any side, separatists or, or Republic. Uh, Galen's kind of a neutralist scientist guy. They're on this planet. Uh, Valette, yeah. Vault, it's weird. I love reading, you guys get the <laughs> audio books, so I make them up no, in my I, mind. I, I, read, I read them also. Yeah, so yeah. I, I have weird, pr- pronunciations. I have to listen to the audiobooks so <laughs> I know how to pronounce right. uh, And that's now, that's Jyn Erso's birth planet now, right. trivia question, right. we now know that answer. So it starts in an interesting time. Yeah, so Perry, what do you think about the relationship between, say, Galen Erso and his wife in the beginning? Because they're, they're essentially prisoners in the beginning, mm-hmm. and even then we still see the manipulation that's happening with the separatists, and because the people that were holding them hostage, they weren't necessarily bad people. Mm. Yeah, I mean, the relationship between Galen and Lyra is that this, I I loved it in the book, and it does make me a little sad that it's not going to be a primary focus of the film. However, at this point, I am predicting that that does serve as somewhat of an inciting incident. And now, if, if that, let's say, something terrible happens with their relationship because of, you know, whatever Krennic is, is cooking up, if that is what kicks off the main story of Rogue One... That's going to mean a lot, given what I know they went through in order to build that relationship Mm -hmm. and find a safe place for themselves. And just how the two of them operate together and and how reliant, he isn't necessarily necessarily reliant on her, but she's the one who transcribes his notes. If anybody out there knows as much as he does, it's her. I think he is reliant on her, and I'll tell you, I think emotionally, because if you look, when they start, when they kind of go their separate ways a little bit Mm -hmm. in the book, he's a mess. I mean, he's he's just so focused and kind of loses himself as the mad scientist, Mm -hmm. you know, really doing all the research and loses that the humanity that I think that that she's the one that gives that to him. When they finally team up at the end and he comes to his senses and she realizes Krennic is is no good. He's so attracted to his work and tunnel vision on his work that when he doesn't have someone else to kind of keep him in line, he will so heavily focus that on that and lose focus of, you know, his family, his morals. I mean, even though he does he does believe that his work was not being weaponized, right. but mm-hmm. he can easily just do that 
if not for her guiding him in the right direction. Lyra Urso is a very important character. I already am in, in a little sad that she might go early or she might be yeah. part of a, a Bambi's mother uh, dying mm -hmm. type situation uh, because uh, she's a very gr just well-written character with a, she, I, you know, the old adage of a strong woman behind a man. She's out in front of Galen. Yeah. She's the one kind of uh, guiding him around because you're right, he's a mad scientist, kind of lost in his own world. He's kind of this, uh, you know, this genius type that, that can't, can't see everything and she can see it and then she's so important, I think. They do a great job with young Jen and writing this little tiny precocious character that's not too on the nose. And right. Lyra's kind of this cool explorer. There's a lot a lot that I think is going to inform Jen. And it's it's a little sad to me that it seems like we might lose her early. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's also, you go, you, obviously we know throughout reading this book that Galen knows about crystals and he's studying the crystals. We also know that she knows things about crystals because of she's in tune with the Force. Yeah. She can't necessarily use it. And I think it's very similar to what we're going to see with Chirrut. Um, I think that the fact that she, like I wanted, I wanted to know more. I like the idea that she could feel like the Coruscant stuff. By the way, in this book, is incredible. Mm. We thought we knew a lot about Coruscant in general. You learn new things. Like I thought the planet was just city from city, right. head to toe, and it's not that. I knew that there was the underground for sure. I mean, mm. even in the Old Republic video games, the Knights of the Old Republic, they talked about that, and that's not canon. But it was hinted that they 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 did that. But they had the fact that that's where he was working. On that kind of like there was there's more land to it and that she's in tune with certain things about the temple um i think that we are gonna that's why i think when that new trailer the international trailer came out and you saw the crystal we knew it we knew that mm. it was a crystal and what the, how much do you think she she's going to pass on to Jin down the line I, I don't know that's the question is how much again a lot in rogue one seems to be around people believing in the force but not using the force right. almost kind of sort of this religion we saw with Laura Santeca being kind of a a, a member of the church of the force right. and force awakens I think it's going to be that I don't think I agree with you. Jin is going to put up, pull out a lightsaber at any point I hope not I hope not I, too yeah, yeah. but it's interesting it's an interesting new take on the force where we so we grew up, yeah, Jan Dodon is the one saying, may the force be with you in A New Hope, but we kind of view it as a Jedi-only thing, but right. really it's not. And I think that what the, these novels have been doing a really good job at, and they certainly do that in this, in this movie, I think Lost Stars is, is something that's done this. You try to see how people are looking at the Empire and the galaxy in general, because it's very, it, it, it is like reading a history book, because at the time when this starts, the Republic is still there mm -hmm. it's still done and then as we get towards the end of the story or the empire's in full swing and we're going to see the empire the way we see him in rogue one but ken as a game of thrones fan mm -hmm. did you see the parallels between like little finger and orson krennic orson krennic is so well written in this james lucino nails it peter baelish is a good 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 uh, analogy there i also think a little bit of hans landa from inglorious bastards kind of oh, this yeah. guy who goes around and he's going to sit down and have some pie with you and it's going to be menacing um and he's he's always moving and yeah there's a lot of strategy there this character uh, that i thought going into the movie might have been uh an administrator a director krennic now has some <laughs> weight to it i actually don't think i would give krennic as much credit as either of those guys because something to me about krennic feels a little it's because i always i already view tarkin on the level of those two characters whereas krennic is kind of you know that little boy chasing that crazy dream following along behind him mm -hmm. and he doesn't really have that much power which is not the impression i got before I had read Catalyst and what I learned about him with what he was going to be doing in Rogue One and what I saw him doing in the trailers, it's kind of crazy how he's manipulated this system and, you know, given himself this persona that he wants that he he doesn't really that, have. That's why I go with Littlefinger because I think yeah. that he he's he's a, he is definitely a status jumper. Like he wants he the, what he's he obsessed does, with his position. He absolutely figurative is. and literally. Mm -hmm. So when you see he's he's about he's the definition of a social climber. When you yeah. look at everything that he's trying to do and the way that he's doing it, he and you mentioned the Tarkin stuff, the stuff with those two, like that is why it is a guarantee that Tarkin will be in this movie. He has to be. Tarkin like, is playing him and I love they're it. They're playing each other though too because there wow, are a lot of times, yeah. remember remember from what from what he does, what Krennic does, Krennic is pretty much setting him up to die in yeah. this battle is with has mm -hmm. orbit and all that stuff that's happening over there. Like it's like okay let's see he's, a, he's, he's great okay let's see what you do governor yeah. get yourself out of that one. And tying him up in that yeah. Yeah. Not just because I know where Tarkin ends up in terms of this whole situation but I still always get that feeling like he is a step ahead 
He is, no, yeah. You, no one in that situation is more intelligent than him. And, you know, if we learned anything from the book, Tarkin, we know that he can figure out what everyone's move is going to be. And we saw that happen here with Krennic a couple times. The, the best thing about the Krennic Tarkin thing to me is this blue collar imperial officer, an engineer, one of those kind of guys, right. uh, versus an upper crust. A uh, politician with a rich family background. We know a lot more of Tarkin's story from reading the Tarkin book, right. which of course Lucina wrote as well. Right. So I love that play that in, inside the Imperial Army, there is a battle, a class warfare battle going it on. It really is. Together. This is what, I mean, I had the pleasure of talking to James Lucino, and one of the things he did with the non canon novel of Darth Plagueis and with this novel, you feel a bit of that kind of mafia feel of the way, like, like you were talking about, like the way that they would one up one another they're in the same family but they're they're going for the next move and it, we know from watching the other movies that it doesn't work out well for Krennic and I will even tell you something that Pablo Hidalgo tweeted out and I just watched New Hope two days ago in that scene when they talk about how the Senate is disbanded now there's a missing chair there's a missing chair in that room and I think that chair was Krennic's I think that Krennic had that chair and we're gonna see that chair in Rogue One so all of that stuff. Are we going to get? A, are we going to get a new uh, moti and tag? Are they going to be in the scene there too? Or are we going to see a, a conference before a conference? <laughs> Maybe. I mean, who knows what's going to happen with with the the way that it all has to tie in? Because I know you were talking when you started reading. You love the stuff with Poggle the Lesser, which is yeah. from Attack of the Clones. They did a great job. I thought James Lucino did a great job in this book of tying in the prequels and the original and, and New Hope mm. and making it all relevant. Absolutely. One of my favorite things is the sudden switch from the uh, Republic to the Empire and how there was a struggle. They didn't have enough stormtroopers yet ready to go. They still had some clones there. The TIE fighters were still being built. So yep. there's kind of this Tarkin had to kind of keep it hush hush. We don't have enough to kind of go out and put our iron, iron fist in the right. galaxy. I love that switch. It also means that there was a lot of uh, Imperial uniforms on back order waiting oh, to be right, used right. right in the moment. It was great stuff. And I, I could talk for a long time about the prequel era stuff that they go into here, and yeah. I'm sure we'll get into it. Yeah, I've just really appreciated seeing the Empire's gradual takeover because, I mean, you guys know this, I've said it before, before coming here and being in this office, my extent of my knowledge in the Star Wars universe was strictly the movies, and, you know, in the movies, it's very easy to look at it as good guy, bad guy, right. empire, bad. Now I have a much more thorough understanding of how the whole operation works. And stories like this just go to show that this thing didn't necessarily just spring to life overnight. Mm -hmm. They had to put a ton of pieces together in order to get the amount of control that we see them have in the movies. Yeah, and I think one of the things about Krennic that I liked also, talking about that control, he never basically goes up to Galen and says, you have to do this. You have to work on it. He manipulates him into it. He makes it, it's like, it's, there's certain, like he won't give him a job for a little bit to where he's, he's desperate. He, then he sends him off to you know, a place he knows he's going to be miserable to. So eventually he's got to do this. And, it's, and, it, and he himself is pretty much desperate, desperate because he needs Galen to work on this and to essentially create the Death Star that we know because, you know, they're, they're fixing it up, they're, they're testing out weapons, but the actual weapon system, this is why I think it ties in so well to Rogue One, at least I believe it will, because this is, people are, are talking about, oh, he's, Galen's the guy who created the Death Star. No, he isn't. He's the one who weaponized it. He's the one who came up with the technology to weaponize it, and you learn so much about him um, doing that. But I, one, one other character I think that we should talk about here is Has Orbit. Ken, will we see him ever again? In uh, any type of movie, any show, book? Hans Obit, yeah. Hans Obit. Haas. 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 You, I say, Haas, is that how they say Haas Obit is yeah, how they say, say it. Would you say Haas? Yeah. Ha no, ha Haas, I don't know. Oh, Haas. Ha has, 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 yeah, has, 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 had, had. Has is one confusing. sentence yeah. in there. Uh, how do they, Haas? Haas Obit. Haas, like, like old big Haas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Haas Obit. Haas Obit. And, and someone tweeted at me that the, the person who reads the book makes him sound like Nick Cage, which, eh, maybe a little bit. Um, interesting choice. Gotta get off the planet. He, he's an alien. <laughs> Actually, yeah. yeah. He is an alien. He is a Dracillian, uh, which is famous in Star Wars for being prune face from Return oh, of the okay. Jedi. So it is an interesting choice that uh, they go with this far-reaching kind of character, uh, this alien species we don't use. That itself is interesting. Yeah. Uh, and I like it. He's like a, a scoundrel, a, 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 a little, little uh, scum heart. of the galaxy who slowly transitions yeah. and becomes very key in a way to uh, what we're about to see in the, in the upcoming movie. So we, I love the character. Do you think we'll see him in Rogue One? Probably not, right? I don't think so, but it's possible. You know, maybe down there with, hanging out with Saw. Yeah. Talking about old times. I don't know. 
I, I doubt it. However, I also don't think it's completely out of the realm of possibility, yeah. given the fact that if something happens to the Urso family, if Saw is involved, you would think someone would reach out to him or touch base with him or uh, just something part of his crew. Respect, he had such, sorry, sorry, but he had such a big part in this book that I'd love to see him. So we know the character in Return of Jedi is, is named Ori Marco, which is became the figure was called Pruneface. Right. So we know Obit's not going to show up there, but that'd be kind of cool if he showed up. I I would, well, we know I that we know Saw Gerrera is obviously in the movie, yeah. and I think that when you see, so I, I was actually happy. I would get a little cheer when Saw shows up, and I thought he was just going to show up to help out Haas for a little bit. But he isn't. You, it makes a lot more sense. The trailer makes a lot more sense when you see the way this book ends. That he's basically the one that helps smuggle the Urso family off of the planet mm -hmm. to get them in this. What's the new planet that they go to? Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I think it's Lamu. Okay, and that's where I think we're gonna mm -hmm. where it's gonna start he's off. Pronounced it right too. Finally, that's how they say it. It's yeah. gonna yeah. start. It's gonna start on Lamu. It's gonna yeah. start there. And so whether or not, like you had mentioned, you had suggested, which I think is not a bad guess, that the bald Saw Guerrero that we saw mm -hmm. might be a flat flashback scene when he's first there, what will you become? Yeah. That whole thing. That might be there or they might just cut that scene completely. I think it's the other way around. Hair, hair saw is the, the flashback. <laughs> oh really? <laughs> that he looks awful. Hashtag but that's hair all saw. the gray. There's but that's all a, the gray. There's a point in the book where they say I think he's got like a streak of, uh, of yeah, something yeah. in his hair. I don't so think, I think that's, yeah, that's flashback case, saw and bald no. saw is present if saw. If that's the case we're not, that, that bald scene's getting cut. Getting cut. <laughs> um, but I will tell you that I think that he was learning more, a little bit more about him and his relationship that he had. Um, yeah, I'm excited to see how that all ties up and what happens moving forward. But Ken, give me your overall thoughts of the book, your favorite scenes, real quick, and then we'll... Yeah, quick. I love this stuff. Uh, uh, I guess it's my time to talk about the prequels. Look, I, I, I call myself a prequelist. doesn't mean I think the movies are great and perfect. It means the prequel era has a lot of deep storytelling left to mine. This book has a lot of politics of Star Wars. Bloodline did it great, and it's, you know, we politics of Star Wars has a bad reputation because the Trade Federation, Naboo, Imperial Senate, all the stuff in the prequels, and I get it, it was executed poorly, but there's a lot of the, the politics of that and going deep into Pogo the Lesser and the G Geonosians and what happened to them right. because we know they, they kind of messed up. There's a reference, I believe, in Rebels about maybe wiping, wiping them all out. It's kind of led to something, there's even stuff in Rogue One that you're thinking, could that be a Geonosis being destroyed. I'm fascinated by it, and it's handled very well. Uh, seeing, um, you know, again, Krennic's doing all this stuff early on in the book, and it's kind of like you're like, he's bad. He's doing it under the name of the Republic, the good guys. Right. So the Separatists, again, going back to this notion that Dooku might be the accidental father of the Rebellion, even though he's working for Palpatine, um, it, I loved all that stuff there. That was some of my favorite, the most juicy stuff. You Once loved got the there. Krennic and Apostle mm. Lecker interrogation scene. Didn't the you? the Poggle yeah. Lesser, and it's and they had and they did a great job with moving Poggle from where he was in the movies to this story because he he's kind of a hot potato. He's he's working for the Separatists, working for the Republic, but he has to be back with the Separatists for Sith because we know right. he gets killed on Mustafar. So I, they did that very well. And the Saw stuff uh, is my other fam uh, favorite stuff because. When he shows up, it wasn't just some little, oh, it's that guy we're going to see. It had some merit. Yeah. And what I love about Jen Erso is she's a Star Wars main character who knows who she is, or at least know where she knows where she comes from. So we know that there's a relationship with Saw and her right. that's not her just running into some, hey, some uh, space lizard told me to talk to you. Right. Mm -hmm. It's a guy she knows. She knows she goes him for a while since she's, she's a little girl. Yeah, Fascinating absolutely. stuff. Mm -hmm. right. yeah, that's what got me excited about Saw being part of this movie is this book. Because when they first announced that, I'm not caught up enough on Clone Wars to have experienced his character. And when they first made the announcement, it was just like, okay, cool. And I like Forrest Whitaker. So, you know, you do you, whatever. I'm sure mm -hmm. it's going to be great. Now that I see what he what he means to the family in the book, I am just ten times more excited than I ever was before. I think he's got so much potential in the movie, and and I'm happy he's not some sort of random piece to the puzzle in order to mm -hmm. to move their mission forward. But overall, I, I already said it before, Lost Stars is still my number one. It's a it's a hard feeling to articulate when you get so obsessed with a group of people that you need to be with them. I have the same feelings with certain movies, like just the first thing that came to my mind is Stand By Me. Something about being part of a group and a, like a young group and a family trying to do something like that. That's the feeling I get from Lost Stars. And I, ha I have that a little here. It's just, I think, the rotation of characters that you're with 
you, you can't kind of recreate that same right. feeling. I don't know if I'm explaining it right because it's, you know, it's more of a feeling rather than a, a statement about how the story progresses or anything like that. It's a feeling. So I rank this just under Lost Stars for that reason, but wow, has this changed my hopes and expectations for Rogue One. And there is, there's really no doubt in my mind that when I watch Rogue One and I see what happens to the characters in the movie, it's going to mean more to me having known what they went through in the past. My favorite thing, though, about this book is at the very end when the storytelling perspective switches to Jin. Mm -hmm. I don't think there was a more brilliant storytelling technique than that that so perfectly paves the way to what I think will be at the beginning of the movie. Yeah, I agree. One of the things that I would tell you guys, though, what I'm... What I'm thinking as I read this book and in looking at footage, going back and watch the trailer, don't expect to see too much Saw Gerrera in this movie. I, yeah, I wouldn't be so. surprised if the scene that we see in that movie, uh, it's pretty much like helps Jin get off the planet uh, because where is he in the trailer besides that one scene? Mm -hmm. That's it. Mm -hmm. he's, in that, he's in that one scene, but what you just said, not only because it's Forrest Whitaker, but because I know what he's done through Clone Wars, what I know he did in this book, there's so much more investment all the way through. So, no, you do not have to read Catalyst in order to really to, to enjoy Rogue One. But I think you will be so emotionally attached, attached going in. We know these characters now. We know them, and it's because Lucino got a copy of the script. He got a copy of the treatment beforehand. He dove into these characters. He was right there with the story group, learning more about who we should use, what's going to happen, all these type of things. That And you felt it. You knew it. This is one of the best Star Wars writers uh, that we've ever got. I mean, I think it's Timothy Zahn and James Lucino, like, right underneath him. I think he's... Lucino is one of the best. He's a master at this stuff, and I think that this is a book that proves how canon is so, uh, how, how important it is in general. You don't need to, do, but I think as a Star Wars fan, you should dive into it. Um, that's, I think that's it, unless there's anything else that we should cover that maybe we missed. We talked about all the, the politics that are happening in there, too. I think that the, there were a couple small references of Darth Vader, for sure. There's, there's a lot of cool little morsels there. Yeah. Janice Grijada shows up. You know who that is? Which one? That's one of the guys who's with the Emperor Return of the Jedi dressed in all purple. Oh, wow. He's one of his, uh, the Imperial dignitaries. There's little morsels like that all the way through that are fun if you're aware of it, but, you know, you don't need to know it, but there's, I love the, the layers this book has. What's the, what's his name? Maz uh, Hadeda? What's, who's? Mas, Masameda. Masameda. Like, he's who? in a lot of different books. He's like mm -hmm. the R2-D2 of the Empire. And he <laughs> he really knows, is. he knows Sidious, who Sidious is. Yeah. Yeah. He knows a lot of stuff. He was there when Yoda walked in. He, he and he and that character lasts all the way up into Bloodline. He's still going. Is in Bloodline? He is. He's you're thinking aftermath. Uh, after yeah. Am I thinking aftermath. of aftermath? Yeah. yeah. But yeah. he goes deep. He goes yeah. deep into the story. He really does, and I want. He's got to be used more. He. I want to see him in a book. <laughs> I, I mean, in a movie. I really yeah. want to see him in a movie. Um, whether or not he shows that he could show up in this. Who he knows? Could. Well, a book might not be a bad idea. Not to get off track, but just to, he's another. He's another character that could be worth knowing how he came to, mm, to, do to his more position. Stuff. Yeah. All right. That's it. That's our overall spoiler-heavy review of Catalyst. You have about a week to read it. You could listen to it. You could read it. Go ahead and do it. Even Mark Ellis, who hasn't read something since uh, Am I Your Mother by Dr. Seuss, uh, <laughs> so long ago, he's finally reading Catalyst. And I'm telling you, if you want to start with one, this is the one. So kudos to James Lucino and, and Delray Publishing for, for this amazing book. Go and check it out. Make sure you check out Jedi Council. That is every Thursday. Our Rebels reviews that we do every Saturday. You can check those out. Ken Knapsack, make sure you follow Ken at Ken Knapsack, Perry Nemiroff at P Nemiroff. You got it. C, and me, Christian Harloff, Christian Harloff on Twitter and Instagram. Thank you guys very much, and we'll see you next time. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.